Hello everyone! It's time to dive between the keys of your keyboard to meet one of the desires that brings them to life. Daniel Guillemet. How are you doing, Daniel? I'm doing very well, thank you. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you as well. Um, to start things off, what got you into electrical engineering and hardware design? Since I was very young, my passion was electronics and, um, and computers. So I didn't really choose. It was, I guess I'm programmed like that. <laughs> So as soon as I, I could uh, start learning and buy a computer, I just went really dove into it very quickly. And um, when I have free time during the weekends and evenings, that's what I do. I do electronics and, and software. I develop since I'm, uh, you know, 15, even before that. What specifically drew yeah. you into keyboard design? It, it dates a long time ago when I was at, in, in college in France. You know, people don't learn touch typing in France. So nobody really types fast. But I ended up being a, an exchange student in Stanford University, in Stanford University, where people type very fast and they're all touch type. So I came there and I realized that I was as fast as they were in terms of solving problems. And when he, he came to typing the result or typing a program on keyboard, I was the slowest. And you know, somebody who uses two fingers to type is very slow compared to a touch typist who use 10 fingers. And so I was blown away by, by the speed. I say, I need, I need to do something. So I painfully learned how to use more fingers than two, and it still didn't work. So when I came back to France, it was still very slow. Then I came back to the US again to work. And I, then I realized that I was looking at the keys all the time. And if you're looking at the keys, well, you, you hunt and peg, basically, and you're not doing your work. So I thought, that was like the haha moment, I thought, if I could not look at the keys, I would not look. You know, kind of uh, the in moment. Uh, but that said, you know, say, oh, what I need is a keyboard with nothing on it. No inscriptions. It's, then I tried to find one and it didn't exist. So I asked my uh, assistant to find a factory in China to make me a keyboard that is completely blank of the highest quality they can. So a very, very good feel. And they sent it to me after three months. Uh, and I typed on it and I doubled my speed within two months. And I was finally touch typing because I stopped looking because there is nothing to look at. So I was really happy with my progress. But the thing that really happened is that people came to my office and looked at the keyboard. <laughs> and they were looking at it and they said, wow, blank keyboard, you must be good. Really? What? What do you mean? Yeah, blank keyboard, you must be good. And I go like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> So there was this cool factor uh, that I didn't think about, you know, at the, at the time. And the people asked me, hey, where do you buy it? Because I'm, I'm cool as well. And I want, I want the, same, uh, the same keyboard. I say, well, it doesn't exist. It's just for me. You know, it's a custom make. It's a one of after one year of people asking me, you know, where did you buy it? I want to buy the same. I said one day, just wait 30 days and you can wait for my website. So I took my keyboard home. I went on my deck, took a picture, one picture, created a one-page website. And um, I said, look, I'm going to try to market this keyboard for uh, 30 days. If after 30 days I sold 15, I will invest in marketing. 10 keyboards sold, I will think about it. And five is a big failure, I stop. So I created this, this website, this one-page website with a buy button. And uh, before that, I went to a company called Rackspace. It's a hosting company. At the time, it was one of the biggest. And I asked 20 sysadmin if they would like to buy my keyboard. And they say, we love your keyboard. We would buy it, but at the price you want to sell it, which was $59, uh, they said, no, it's too expensive. I said, okay, I will think about that. So I switched on the website on uh, Monday morning, and I took figure out the price. I don't tell you the price yet, because uh, you will see what happened. I will tell you just a little later. So I sent one email to Gizmodo, Gizmodo, the gadget blog. And they say, they look at the, the, the website, they say, wow, blank keyboard, the slogan, blank keyboard only for the best, you know? And they say, okay, we are going to uh, post uh, a little blurb about it. So they posted the blurb. And then it was picked up by Slashdot at the time, well, like another gadget blog. And by Thursday, we had millions of visitors uh, on the site. And I got a call from the New York Times Andrew Zipper that says, hey, uh, we would like to interview you and, and feature your keyboard in the next uh, Tech Monday uh, session, which is in, in three, four days. Uh, can you overnight the keyboard? I say, uh, of course I can. So we ended up in the New York Times seven days later on Monday, boom, a picture of my keyboard. And the thing is that 
Uh, remember I told you I want to sell 15 during 30 yeah, days? Yeah, I was thinking, that escalated quickly. So, we ended up, after the New York Times, being everywhere on TV, in most uh, newspapers and media online. In 30 days, we sold for a quarter of a million dollars of keyboards. Congratulations, my word. So, and the thing is that I didn't have any keyboards. You know, I just had mine, my one keyboard. So I told the customer, I said, hey, look, you know, sorry, we are sold out, uh, but you know, we can refund you now, but if you wait three months, we are going to ship. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the 95% said, well, this, this keyboard is so badass. We are going to, to wait. So I said, okay. And then we started the, the keyboard business like that. So, and the thing is about the price. So people said 100% of those 26 admins said at $59 is too expensive, we don't buy. Actually, I went to $89 and then it was a huge success. I went the other way. Uh, I know some artists who, when going to art shows, when they raise their prices, you actually get a better reception. Yeah. Um, so what... Yeah, because people, uh, it's a perception of quality and also if it's very hard to get, then you want it more, you know? And speaking of wanting it, why do you think keyboards have really blossomed into such a popular hobbyist scene? Like, we have people making their own now, we have all these custom builds and everything, it has just expanded and is blossoming massively now. So... Um... In, in the early 80s, I started typing on the uh, IBM PC and they all came with this amazing IBM Model M keyboard with click, click keys, like very loud, very comfortable. And then in the early 90s, production uh, went to China, manufacturing went to China, and they started to make very inexpensive keyboards, but they were all membrane. And I remember typing on those keyboards and I was dearly missing the days of the IBM Model M keyboard. Even the Mac at the beginning had amazing keyboards. And I think why it's coming back because people love a good quality keyboard. It really makes them feel good. It makes them enjoy typing. You know, it's very enjoyable to type on a good keyboard and it's very not enjoyable to type on a $1, you know, keyboard made, you know, out just of plastic. Yeah. And yes, that's after a while, you know. And now, in the many years since you first debuted with the, uh, the completely blank keyboard, how do you keep going about innovating with keyboard tech? How do you challenge yourself to find new ways to make them all the more functional and useful for the end user? So it's always based on uh, trying to solve a problem or a need. For example, uh, we were one of the first uh, keyboard manufacturers to add a big round knob to adjust the volume because at the time uh, Skype was the big thing uh, when you wanted to video conference somebody and you need to quickly adjust the volume Otherwise, you know, you have uh, it's, it's don't to reach out for the mouse. It takes way too much time. So that was the need was, you know, be able to easily go up and down in volume. So we need a big volume knob that you, you can't miss. Um, we talked about, you know, saving the planet, consuming less energy. We were the first manufacturer in the world to add a sleep button that will one push and your whole computer goes to sleep you can go to lunch and then you come back with a key wakes up so all these you know that's something we we we, we did and then we uh, you know how we have so many notifications about uh, for example uh, bitcoins going up become going down google doc a new email uh, your boss email your mom's uh, birthday your project to do list so we have so many notifications and we try to find a way to make that go away. Okay. So, and then we, we had this idea that we could display the notification on the keyboard. So ambiently, so it's just ambient information. You don't need to look, for example, right now I'm looking at my screen, but I don't need to look at the weather app to see if it's sunny because I have the window on my left and I don't need to look at it because I just know it's ambient, it's sunny right there. That's ambient information. So. That cuts, that cuts a lot of notification. Some, some software programmer, uh, programmers use it to make sure that 
their software test pass. So when the, it passes, when they pass the test, you know, some keys are green. If it doesn't pass, it's red and they, they can go look what's going on. Now, out of everything though, what would you say is the defining feature that sets DOS keyboards apart from the rest? So the I think we, we focus on, on a very solid, high quality, no nonsense keyboards. So we are not doing super fancy keyboards with, you know, uh, bone heads uh, instead of the escape key and things like that. For us, it's a, it's a tool that makes people more efficient and we want to keep it a keyboard. Some keyboards really go nuts in features and with LCD screens that will display information like a TV. And we think that's not the role of a keyboard. A keyboard is an input device. So we don't want to change that. We want to add to it if it doesn't get in the way into being a keyboard, like the Q software, which displays you know the notification in color on your keys. That doesn't get uh, in the way of, of typing or using your keyboard. So we keep that going. And uh, you know, it's a you know, solid, solid uh, good looking keyboard, high quality. And uh, that's what we do. And um, just out of curiosity, have you ever explored anything with split keyboards? I know those have become something of a fascination for some, whereas others are like, this is an abomination. My hands don't know where they're going. So we, we looked at those many times. There's a thing that uh, people don't realize. Maybe I can do the demo here on, on, the, on, the, on the camera. So when you have a, 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 a straight keyboard, okay, people think, well, if I, if I type straight, I'm going to, you know, hurt my, my, uh, head, my uh, wrist, okay? But in fact, what, what's happening is that if you put your, your straight keyboard, okay, mm -hmm. when you put your hand like this, and then you, when you curve your finger, see that? It becomes a straight line. So even though my arms, uh, at an angle, which is good, okay, so I don't uh, bend my wrist. When you bend your fingers, they become a straight line. So it's perfectly ergonomic on a straight keyboard. So that's mm -hmm. the thing. You know, if you look at it like this, it's not ergonomic, you need to do this. But in fact, as soon as you bend your fingers, which you need to do if you want to type, then it's ergonomic. So the straight keyboard is as ergonomic as a split keyboard. You may prefer a split keyboard because maybe it's more spacious, you can put, you know, some some of it on the left and some of it on the right. Sometimes you, you can cut that in two, you know. But mm -hmm. it's very ergonomic. If you just let your uh, anatomy do it, do its job and not try to, you know, turn your wrist in a weird way, which will hurt you anyway. Uh, but yes, I mean, it's, it's a question of preference. Uh, some people really like more the already the look of a split keyboard, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so right now we we don't have any and. Uh, Something that we are looking at actually right now. Mm -hmm. Has there been any actually, any experiments that like you wish they could have come together but didn't quite with your keyboards? Like any kind of en enhancements that were just like mm, so close. So I mean, we we looked we looked at um, adding displays. Um, so what we did, you you see the numeric keypad. Mm -hmm. So we removed the keys of the keypad and we put an Android, uh, an Android phone in it. Wow. And that Android phone, when you, let's say you want to have uh, the calculator, you launch the calculator on your PC or Mac, but it was actually display on the Android. And uh, that display can also be a trackpad because it's a touch mm -hmm. interface. So we worked uh, on that concept and um, it was it was uh, working somewhat, but it's a huge uh, undertaking to have something that works seamlessly and, and you know, between the, the main monitor and the Android keypad in that in that case. So, yeah, I gotta imagine two operating systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we could actually move, move the, we control the cursor of the PC from that Android uh, phone or device. It was not a phone, it was just an Android, like mini tablet. Mm -hmm. So we did that, um, but you know, we did not release it. It's it's more like a experiment experiment that we, we did, which was somewhat successful, but not uh, enough to be commercialized, you know? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know if you know, but even gaming had a similar experiment with uh, Nintendo. They had the Wii U and they tried to do a similar thing with like trying to merge a more traditional controller with a tablet that was about this big. And yeah, it, they had a similar issue of just like, it was fascinating tech, but they couldn't quite 
get it to be you know mainstream finalized so i bet yeah. it just went more wholesale tablet with the nintendo switch all right um we have ripped through all of the questions here so um we are now here at the end so do you have a question for me and or my audience uh, yes i have a question for you actually two questions what are your top three games that you like to play these days definitely survival horror is a big one for me um i really enjoy that i love choice based games doesn't necessarily have to be an rpg it could be something like um the telltale style i'm not sure if you're familiar but they do what's almost like interactive television uh wales interactive also does that uh really well they've actually brought back the full motion video stuff so it's all live action actors but you can still make the story go in different directions um and i would say that like Definitely, you know, just general action, but with like some weight to it. I don't just want to be able to point at the guy and boom, he's gone. It's more like when you have to work for it, when you have to put some thought into it and be more careful and methodical, that really, I, I really appreciate that because it's not, it's not realistic, but it feels more like you're actually earning it as opposed to just say something very simplified like Galaga or uh, you know anything along those lines it's just a little bit more complexity to make you think as much as you are instinctively clicking and um, the flow state that that can get you in that just is something else because exactly when you're saying about when you are just touch typing I had to uh, uh, very quick story um, I learned to touch type because of multiplayer games because I'm trying to type to people to be like there are people pushing on our objective here and when there's a rocket flying at your face you have to type very quickly <laughs> so I know exactly what you mean about just learning to not look at the keys I just had to pretend that they were not there <laughs> yeah uh, my other question um, it's more long-term vision of the uh, gaming industry do you mm -hmm. think that the gaming industry and the video games in general could replace uh, the movie industry like hollywood basically oh in terms of actual make like money they're making they already have in terms of like actual profits they do make more money than the movie industry the main issue overall is um honestly more of a cultural issue like um in terms of maturing as an industry because it's a surreal thing to think but like the oldest veterans of the pc gaming space are for the most part still alive only a few of them have passed away at this point and it's this very unique space where we're like we have evolved so amazingly quickly when you just look back at the 90s and then you go to even as just you know as far back as like to the 2010s the difference in what we can render what we can accomplish what what even roles there are designated for like the first few decades there was no such concept as a narrative designer and now it's an entire profession with college courses and everything so it's a case of everything is rapidly evolving but we are kind of reaching a point where just throwing more money at things isn't the end game solution we're finally getting to the point where it's more artisanal where you can actually have more thoughtful iteration on the medium and everything a lot of the tools have been diversified and stuff like that like you can now use the unreal engine and not know a single line of c plus plus because they have this um visual scripting language known as blueprints which is literally like just it's like electrical engineering you connect the nodes together and it makes the logic happen so that's going to lead to a massive diversification it already is in several cases i know indie developers who otherwise wouldn't be able to make games who are now diving in and that's a really exciting prospect there is also just you know in terms of like critical reception and what we value and reward that is something else that needs a bit more maturing because right now there's still a lot of people trying to justify saying that as a medium as an industry it is valid that leads to praising certain things that aren't actually moving it forward but 
are nice prestige pieces as opposed to things that like actually really fundamentally it's like oh my word you're replicating ice melting and it's actually working like it's supposed to and stuff like that as opposed to say something like the last of us which is you know makes very good television but in terms of like actual game design does not really challenge anything other than rendering every follicle of hair on a guy's beard it's been quite the roller coaster ride to just watch it all happen I'm sorry, I realized that was a yep. lengthy answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I realized that was a lengthy answer. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, thank you for the answer, yeah. And where can people find DOS keyboards? The, the best way to find us is on the web, daskeyboard.com. And uh, from there, if you are living in different countries, uh, then the US, then we, you have a little where to buy menu and you can find the, you know, your, your country, if you're in France or Germany or even Israel. So daskeyboard.com is the way to go. Oh, also, right. um, I want to note you can find it on, they have an Amazon storefront as well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. It has been lovely talking with you. Yeah. Thank you. Same here.